Good evening. On behalf of Purina Pro Plan and the American Kennel Club, I would like to welcome you to this evening's webinar. I hope you're having a great evening this evening and thank you so very much for joining us. Um, I would like to introduce our guest speaker tonight who is Dr. Marty Greer. She is a veterinarian um, out of uh, Lomira, Wisconsin. She has three practices there and she has the first ever drive-through veterinarian clinic in the country. She is uh, also a uh, an attorney who is licensed in the state of Wisconsin and a uh, uh, an author. She has written a, uh, books called Canine Reproductive and Neonatology and Your Pandemic Puppy. And so we're happy to uh, welcome Dr. Marty Greer uh, this evening and just so everybody knows ahead of time I will be trying to answer your questions or uh, to put them towards the end and uh, we will also be uh, recording this presentation and there will be a link to it so anything that you missed any slides that you missed if you want to go back over and review um, you can do that and also feel free to take screenshots um, of the screen if you see something but definitely have pencil and paper ready to take notes because Dr. Marty does move fast and there's a lot to learn tonight so let's get started Dr. Marty Greer. Thank you um, first question is can you see one slide or do you see two slides? We see the one slide as it should be. Okay, great. Then we can get started because I always struggle a little bit with presenter view on different uh, programs. So tonight we're gonna go over two different sections of the reproductive cycle of the dog. Uh, the first is the post-whelping care and complications and the second is weaning. So during post-whelping care and complications, we're gonna talk about retained puppies and placentas maternal skills and aggression, the use of calcium, placental fluid, the adaptive collar, stress, pain medication for C-sections, how the females eat and drink during this time period, agalactia, which is failure to produce milk, mastitis, which of course is an infection of the mammary gland, metritis is an infection of the uterus, diarrhea of the bitch, and eclampsia. And then we're gonna talk about reducing the bitch's lactation during the weaning period, how to get the puppies to eat better, water and food for the puppies, some fun things with environmental enrichment, and then deworming parasite control and the comprehensive physical exam prior to the time that the puppies leave your facility. So first we're gonna talk about postpartum care and complications, which are really important. In fact, I got two messages today from uh, the office about someone that had called, two different people that had called regarding some post-op post complications. So the first thing we want to talk about are retained puppies and placentas. And just so it's clear, this can be life-threatening not only to the puppy that's left behind, but also to the bitch if it, the problem isn't discovered in time. Uh, the fever, the bitches can run a fever, a pretty significant fever after uh, whelping if there's a retained puppy and or placenta. And it can go as far as uterine rupture and the loss of the bitch. We had a client who unfortunately had a puppy left behind for an extended period of time unaware. And so there can be some pretty significant changes that can happen for the bitches. And it's really, of course, not healthy for the puppy or the bitch. This x-ray on the screen shows a puppy that's in an awkward position. You can see the head is uh, behind the shoulder and the front leg. So the puppy is in a C-shaped position, no amount of oxytocin, no amount of feathering, and no amount of good luck is gonna get this puppy to come out short of a C-section. So if you have a situation like this, you need to realize that this is an emergency. This is something that you do need to go to surgery for, and you do need to get taken care of. So retained puppies and placentas are very common. And one of the things we wanna talk about is to prevent the retained puppy, the importance of a puppy count x-ray. So we strongly recommend puppy count x-rays and we're gonna talk about those in just a second. The other thing is I'm gonna talk about remembering to get all the puppies out at C-section. Now this is not the breeder's responsibility, but <clears throat> in the last year, I've had two surrounding practices leave a puppy behind and it turns into a real disaster. Uh, and so at my C-section, literally out loud at every C-section that I do, my staff hears me say ovary, ovary, cervix before I sew up the uterus and put things back together at C-section. And they look at me and they kind of laugh and I'm like, yeah, I, I know. And every time a vet student comes in, I say to them, I do not want to see your name 
in the disciplinary action of your state listed because you left a puppy behind. So you need to make sure that you didn't just see where the uterus got smaller at the north end of the uterus where you think it might be getting close to the ovary. I want you to actually see and touch the ovary on each side. And I want you to see and touch the cervix and slide your finger down far enough that you actually make sure of it. Because we've had people go home after C-sections and have puppies born or have puppies found later, sometimes much later. One was much later and the uh, female ruptured her uterus and nearly died. So it can be very serious. It's super important that we get every single puppy out. And I know that sounds so easy, but if it were that easy, we wouldn't have seen two of these episodes recently. So it's really important that we get a puppy count x-ray prior to the time that the bitch goes into labor. Um, and if you can't, or if you aren't a fan, you can always get one at the time you think she's done, but don't assume that just because she stopped having puppies and started to rest and started to eat that she's actually done. So I have some tips here that if you have a veterinarian that's willing to do this and they're struggling a bit to get really good x-rays, I'm gonna teach you a few things that you can take to the veterinary clinic. Or for those of you who are veterinary staff, you can take these back to work. So number one is we want the female to come in fasting. No breakfast the morning of her x-ray because food in the stomach can be um, obscuring the number of puppies that are there. The second thing we do is if we take our first x-ray and we see that there's a lot of fecal material or stool in the large intestine, we match the dog or we put in a suppository or both. Um, for those of you who know what matching is, I probably don't have to explain it completely, but we take matches. Some people light them first and cool them. Other people just put them in straight out of the matchbook. Please use paper matches and not wooden matches. Wooden matches are a little harsh. Um, and you can slide two matches or a suppository or both into the rectum. I just had four dogs come in the other day that the client forgot to bring stool samples on. So we put a match and a suppository in each of the four dogs. And within two minutes, each dog had had a stool. It is very, very reliable to get the dogs to have a stool. I don't know who was standing at a dog show the first time and said, I don't know, Joe, what do you think? If we stick a match in her, do you think she'll have a stool? I really don't know who thought that up, but it works like a charm. Suppositories, you can get glycerin suppositories at Walmart. They're not prescription items. They're no big deal. So um, the, the third thing we do is we take both a right and a left lateral x-ray, meaning we lay the right side on the x-ray table, and then we roll her under, not over, with her legs under, and we take an x-ray of the left side down. So we take both views, and I'll show you some x-rays here in a couple of minutes to illustrate the importance of this and the differences that we see. Now, if your vet is taking digital x-rays, they should be able to get you an accurate count but it needs to be after day 55 of pregnancy so that the puppies are mature enough with their skeleton that you can actually see them clearly. So be really careful, be really aware. Now, once we get up above 12 puppies, I think it's hard to count accurately. If you have that many puppies, I'm gonna tell you you should probably have a C-section anyway, but just because they saw 12 on the X-ray doesn't mean at 12 they stop counting and they stop looking for puppies. They really need to make sure they do the ovary, ovary, cervix thing. So she should be fasting. We match her and then we walk her. And I just love this picture. It, so if, if you're kind of thinking this is gonna be a boring lecture tonight, I just wanna give you a little bit of something to um, humor you. So yes, walk her before you go in to the veterinary clinic so that they don't have to take the time to put matches and suppositories in and send you back outside. So this is an X-ray of a pregnant dog that came in not fasted. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see her stomach, it's full of uh, food. And then across the top, just below her backbone is a lot of fecal material or stool. So she has too much stool in her colon for us to accurately count the number of puppies here. So we took this x-ray, as soon as we saw the x-ray, my staff knows better than to continue taking x-rays. They know that they have to stop at this point, put in matches and suppositories, take the dog outside. And yes, in January in Wisconsin, we still go outside, can be pretty miserable, but we do it anyway. And then this is the same dog's x-ray. You can see how much more clear it is that there are three puppies on this x-ray. Then I'm gonna have you say, well, why are we taking two x-rays? And I'm gonna tell you that on this view, you can see that there are some puppies, but when we flip her to the other side, a third puppy makes its appearance. So that's why we take two x-rays is frequently they can be completely superimposed over each other. And as soon as you roll them to the other side, then you can see that there's a difference. Here is another illustration of that on this x-ray. I've numbered these puppies. They don't actually come with numbers on their heads. We have to add those on digitally. So on this x-ray, it looks like there are seven puppies. Um, if you can make this a little bigger on your screen, you might have an easier time seeing it, but this is the same dog rolled to the other side, and now we can see that there are eight. 
So it's really important that we get good x-rays, good quality x-rays, and that we follow this up very carefully to make sure that we get an actual accurate number. You need to know what time the, the, when, that the bitch is done, you can go to bed, you need to know, you can go to work, whatever it happens to be, you need to know that it's safe to go ahead. Now, there are people who are reluctant to take x-rays because they're concerned about the exposure of the bitch and the puppies to radiation. Um, and the only articles that we have published on any kind of concerns about safety are from the 1960s. And since the 1960s, we've developed rare earth cassettes, then we developed digital x-rays. So the amount of radiation exposure is very, very minimal. Now, that being said, faster first, have her have her stool first so that you only have to have two x-rays and you don't have to have three or four. But this is not something that's gonna to lead to cancer in the puppies as they grow up. It is gonna save the bitch at some point. You're gonna save a bitch or a puppy by knowing how many puppies are there. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of an accurate puppy count x-ray. There isn't anything that drives me much crazier than looking at these x-rays that people put up on Facebook and then asking how many puppies there are. Number one, if your vet isn't taking good enough x-rays to tell you this information, you need to find somebody that you can work with at will. And number two, the quality of the x-ray, once you get them to the Facebook, they change the um, quality of the image when it becomes a JPEG image instead of a DICOM image. So we lose a lot of clarity and you cannot accurately count. So please don't ask your friends and, and other people on Facebook how many puppies there are. Please ask your veterinarian. And if they didn't take a good enough x-ray, you march back in there and you tell them, we're going to have her have a stool and we're going to get an x-ray that's good enough for me to know. So it's super, super important. What are your other options to know that your bitch is done having puppies? Well, you can try feeling her, but many times when you put your hands on her uterus, it's gonna contract down and it's gonna feel firm, and you may be deceived into believing that there's another puppy there. So ultrasound, if your veterinarian has ultrasound, you can do that. Fetal Doppler is a great tool to monitor puppies' heart rates, but if the puppy is deceased, which many times the last puppy is, the Doppler isn't going to be able to pick up a heartbeat, so it's not going to tell you if there's a puppy left behind or not. If it has a heartbeat, obviously there's a puppy there. And the puppy's heart rate is going to be 160 or higher, and the bitch's heart rate is probably going to be more like 120. So you should be able to hear a difference in heart rates and be able to tell if there's a puppy left behind or not. But you can't always tell, like I said, if the puppy is deceased. And then WhelpWise, the Whelping Monitor Contraction Service, is a great tool as well. They can get an idea from monitoring the contractions whether or not it seems that there's still a puppy left behind based on the contractility of the uterus. So you have some other tools, but x-ray, hands down, is going to be the best. You can see everything in the abdomen at once. With ultrasound, it can be a little bit trickier to find one, especially if the puppy is deceased or starting to um, not be a normal fully developed puppy and break down and it's, it can be hard to see those on ultrasound. So x-ray is gonna be best. Number two, I wanna talk about maternal skills and aggression. Most of the time when we see maternal aggression, it's in inexperienced bitches, especially bitches at C-section. But I have seen bitches that have had vaginal births and they still are aggressive toward their puppies. So we have to be really aware of that. And we put on our discharge instruction sheets from C-section, do not leave the bitch alone with the puppies unattended until you are certain she will not harm them. Um, and harm may mean that she snaps at them. Harm may mean that she lays on them. There can be a lot of things that can happen. Um, pig rails are not enough to save all puppies. So you need to be attentive to the fact that bitches can in an instant just go from being calm and losing their cool and grabbing a puppy and doing serious damage to it. So some of the causes for this can be low calcium. So hypocalcemia, giving calcium gel and calcium injections can reduce the risk of this. Um, we also use on our bitches that have had C-sections, all of my bitches go home with post-op pain medication. I usually use Rimadyl or Medicam. Medicam is my preferred, but Rimadyl is also a good choice. Um, in addition, we use the Adaptil or the Thunder Ease collar. We'll talk about those a little bit more. Sometimes you need to physically separate the bitch. So in other words, leave the puppies in the whelping box and take her out or put the puppies in an incubator and leave her in the whelping box. And sometimes you do need to muzzle her and sit with her sometimes for 72 hours. It may take three days before motherhood kicks in. And I've had two of my own bitches do this. One of them was vaginal birth. She decided on the third puppy that that wasn't okay. The puppy tried to be born, um, came out, turned around, tried to start nursing before the placenta was detached and she was going to kill that puppy. So unless you are there, 
you need to know that these bitches aren't always going to be nice to their puppies at the very beginning. They need some time to figure it out. If push comes to shove, I do use gabapentin on some of these girls just to calm them down. Uh, but again, you have to be careful because that can also cause drowsiness and she may be more likely to lay on a puppy or um, not really fully understand what she's supposed to be doing. So you can use gabapentin, but sometimes physical separation and muzzling is just absolutely gonna be necessary. Now, these are two rather gruesome pictures. The one on the right is an older puppy. The one on the left is a young puppy. This is a uh, Belgian uh, sheepdog that had its ear taken off by its mother within a few minutes of the time the puppy was born. So, uh, and in fact, I just had a puppy at the practice the other day that had had this done as well. So unfortunately, this is not uncommon. So it just takes a second for a bitch to snark at a puppy and do some serious damage. So be super aware of that. Now, like I said, calcium can significantly reduce the risks of this. It'll reduce the risk of aggression toward the puppies, aggression toward people, and eclampsia. Eclampsia is low calcium, which we'll talk about with a couple of slides later. Um, we use the Oral Calcium Plus Gel. Um, this is a Revival product. I do work for Revival, but this is my own personal bitch that found the empty tube in the garbage can the, about three days after she had the puppies. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty palatable. She was on my bed. Um, munching on the tube, I did have to take it away before she ingested too much plastic. But the palatability of this product outshines the other oral calcium gel on the pro products on the market. So injectable calcium works great, oral calcium gel works great, and this will significantly improve the bitch's attitude toward her puppies and toward people. It requires oxytocin in the brain is what, and we're, we're going to talk about oxytocin too, so don't get too excited here. Um, that I'm skipping over it. But oxytocin in the brain is a really important uh, compound to improve the bitch's bonding to her puppies. It doesn't just let down milk, it improves her bonding toward her puppies, but it requires calcium for all that pathway to work. So without enough calcium, oxytocin can't do its job alone. So oxytocin helps the uterus to contract, it helps milk let down, but it also helps attitude. So there are the two pieces of this that you can really do very simply with calcium, either injectable or oral and oxytocin. Now injectable calcium must be 10% calcium. The cattle product, which is 23%, if you get sub two under the skin of the dog will cause chemical burns. So make sure you're using a 10% calcium solution if you're doing injections. Placental fluid is also very useful. I save placental fluid from every single C-section. You can also save it at your whelpings. There's frequently enough that comes out in the placenta in little pockets that you can collect it. I save it in a sterile bowl until we get done with the surgery and then we put it in this small yogurt bottle and send it home because when puppies leave my C-sections, they're more likely to smell like laundry soap, like Tide and not like mom and the placental fluid. So I save this. I don't send placentas home unless people actually request them, but I do send placental fluid. Now it needs to be kept refrigerated because it comes without preservatives. And I only keep it for two or three days because it starts to get kind of icky after that. Uh, it'll get a little stinky, but it can be very, very useful. I've had bitches of my own go home, lay on one side of the whelping box, looking across the whelping box at the puppies going, well, you deliver them, you take care of them. And as soon as I pl put placental fluid on the head and the tail of the puppy, the bitches will get up, go over, start licking the puppies and motherhood kicks in. So please remember that placental fluid is easy for your vet to collect and, and retain and send home with you. If they don't ask the technicians at the C-section to try and save some of it for you to take on a long home, it does make a big difference. The next thing is the Adaptil or the Thunder Ease collar. Both of these are pheromone collars. They are not the same as the lavender or other essential oil collars. They actually contain the same pheromone that is in placental fluid. They're being marketed to reduce anxiety and stress during things like thunderstorms. But this was actually developed from the mammary gland and the placenta of uh, newborn puppies. So what's really cool about it is it's, it's kind of taking it back full circle now. It doesn't say this on the label, and we're not going to get the company to do a label claim on it. But I'll tell you that a lot of dogs that aren't real great at motherhood is we'll put these collars on three days before the scheduled C-section if it's scheduled. And it does make a big difference in their attitude toward their puppies. It's not absolutely going to solve all your problems, but it should be used as a great tool. And using it three days ahead will make your life better when you take those puppies home. The next thing is to be really aware of stress, overcrowding, housing, and other dogs in the facility. There are um, clients. I have a client with Golden Retrievers. He sent me a picture again the other day. I've been to his house and seen this. His Golden Retrievers grandma will go in and lay down with the puppies, and mom is just fine with it. I mean, 
I would not allow that at my house. My corgis would rip each other apart if another dog came into the room where the puppies were. But he's got golden retrievers and they all get along and they all leave each other. But be aware that that's not always the case. So you shouldn't have crowding. You shouldn't have too many kids from the neighborhood over when the puppies are being born. You shouldn't have everybody in the, in your family in the room. You really need to make it as stress-free as possible. And if other dogs are staring at her or she's feeling crowded or there's too much barking in the facility, too much stress, she's going to stress and she's going to run around. She's going to step on puppies. She's going to lay on puppies. She's not going to take good care of them. So please be aware of that and have your whelping rooms quiet. Have your whelping room as stress-free as you possibly can for the quality of the care that the bitch can give her on puppies. And then, like I said a little bit ago, post-op pain medication is really essential. There is no labeled drug for post-C-section in the bitch. Like I said, I primarily use Medicam. You can use Rimadil as well. Um, but when Medicam first came to market, it's been over 20 years ago now that it came to the market. And when Rimadil came to market, I went to the meetings, listened to the lectures, asked the veterinarian, so is this labeled for dogs after C-section? And the speaker looked at me and said, oh no, you don't need post-op pain medication on dogs. After C-sections, they're so euphoric that they just want to take care of their puppies. Well, this was obviously spoken by a man and not by a woman that's ever had a kid because we all know euphoria only goes so far. So Medicam, Rimadil, Carprofen, um, these drugs are absolutely safe. I've used them for over 20 years on my bitches. I send them, I give them an injection the minute the last puppy is out. I send them home with a three-day a course of the medication and it does improve their maternal skills they're more comfortable they sleep better they rest better they take better care of their puppies they eat and drink better they're better moms on pain medication and i still just can't believe that there are veterinarians sending dogs home without pain medication i do try to avoid narcotics and tramadol a lot of veterinarians like those but my concern is that those make the bitches drowsy and they may not always leave them with the best judgment they may lose their inhibition and start to get snarky at the puppies so I've used Medicam. I started it on my own bitch 21 years ago, and I've never looked back. I've never lost puppies to anything that happened by the drug passing through the milk and into the puppies and causing any kidney or liver problems. So um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your veterinarian if you have to. Tell them you need pain medication and make sure you take some home. The next thing is after the bitches whelp, they may not eat or drink particularly well. They may be very, very devoted to their puppies and don't want to get up and eat and drink. They may not feel good. They may be exhausted. There's a lot of reasons that these bitches don't eat and drink really well. So it's important that we pay attention to that and we don't just say, well, give her a couple of days. She'll be okay. If you're not getting her to drink adequately, she's not going to be able to make milk. So you can give sub Q fluids. Now this is a cat, I know that, but I only had a picture of me with a cat giving fluids, not a dog. Without drinking enough or enough sub Q fluids, she's not gonna be able to lactate because she needs to have that fluid intake to produce milk. You can give it orally if you can get her to drink. You can give it uh, a, an electrolyte solution that may taste good. You can use Pedialyte or Puppy Light, the Revival product. I like to give salty foods. I think salty foods help the bitches to drink better. So if your husband's sitting on the couch eating pretzels, he can share them with the dog. You can try other flavors of water. So you can add beef broth, chicken broth, something along those lines, or you can give subcutaneous fluids if necessary. Um, and then of course, like I said, the electrolyte solutions um, can work really well. The Puppy Light does have a chicken, base, chicken soup base, so it tastes pretty good. The other thing you can do is you can mix some of the dog food, the canned dog food with some water, whisk it into a bucket with some warm water. And then of course you can top dress her food or just feed her the canned puppy food uh, to get her to eat. It's really important she eats, it's really important she drinks. And bitches need to eat two to four times their normal intake to adequately produce milk for their puppies. If she doesn't get enough calories, she's not gonna be able to lactate sufficiently. And the better she lactates, the less work it is for you. So if you can get mom to drink and eat well, you're going to have a much better time. You're going to get more sleep and you're going to feel better about having a litter. Additionally, if she does eat so much that she ends up with some loose stools, probiotics can be helpful. And we'll talk about probiotics in a couple of minutes. Then we have agalactia, which is the actual um, name for the lack of milk production. Now, it's not the lack of galactic creatures. That's not the same kind of galactic that we're talking about. It's agalactia. And we have a couple drugs that can be used to help with this. Metoclopramide is also known as Reglan. Um, it does a great job of bringing in milk, and I'll give you the dose on the next slide. 
Domperidone is an equine product, a horse product. I personally have not had great success with it, but there are people who do. So if your vet uses it and it works well for them, that's great. I see a lot of bitches drool very heavily and not tolerate the medication very well, so I tend not to use it. Um, fenugreek is the herb that a lot of people talk about using. Instead of just using fenugreek or going to the store and getting some of the human compounds, they mix some of those fenugreek products with other things that we don't know are safe for dogs. So I'm not a fan of putting dogs on things that aren't already tested on other dogs. So I tend to avoid the fenugreek products other than the Oxymama. Uh, and we know the Oxymama product is safe. And then I've had really good success kind of um, using bratwurst, oatmeal, and sweet potatoes. Now, bratwurst I learned from one of my Newfoundland breeders. And the first time I heard it, I had a litter of puppies of my own. And I sent my husband to the local locker plant and said, you need to go buy some brats. And he's like, oh, good. I said, they're not for you, dear. They're for the dog. And I don't know what there is about bratwurst, and I mean sausages, that helps bitches bring in their milk, but it works like a charm. Also, the lactation nurses on the human side that help women to nurse their babies recommend oatmeal, sweet potatoes, like uh, sweet potatoes and other root vegetables. And then, like I said, oxytocin helps to let down milk. So metoclopramide makes the milk, oxytocin lets it down. The two of them act in tandem with each other, but they don't do the same thing. They, they do opposite things. And then warm compresses to improve the blood flow to her mammary glands can really help bring in the milk as well. So agalactia, the dose for that metoclopramide or reglan is 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram three times a day. Now, a lot of veterinarians are not familiar with this use for metoclopramide. They probably have metoclopramide or reglan in the hospital injectable liquid or tablets for dogs that are in for vomiting. And it does work to reduce vomiting, but one of the cool side effects is about 75% of the dogs that we give this to will improve their lactation. So you can do that. You can also use that with Oxymama. So you can use all three, Oxytocin, Oxymama, and Metoclopramide together. They will not cause an overdose. You can use them very safely in tandem with each other, and you can have some really great outcomes. So this works well in combination. Like I said, Sweet potatoes, oatmeal, bratwurst, they all work. And then these are my drugs, my oxytocin and my other drugs. So we have a short video here. And I'm going to see if I can to work. I need to turn up my volume. All right, Let's see if you can hear it. When you looked in my direction, I thought my heart might explode. My heart was racing and I thought it might explode. Because my sympathetic nervous system caused norepinephrine to stimulate my cytoatrial node. When you looked in my direction, when you first looked into my eyes, when you looked into my eyes, my stress response diverted blood flow from my stomach and intestines, and it felt like butterflies. I knew that I wanted to marry ya as my ventral tegmental area sent signals to my nucleus accompanying. And oh, oh, oh my lord, the anticipation of reward that do, do, dopamine starts pumping. I know my person is the ocean to go. Give me that dose of dopamine, the serotonin, feel good, burn, strike the heart attack. And I'm never gonna change my mind. When you first smiled at me, I did foolish things. Really, 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 really stupid things. Because my judgment was impaired by a reduction in activity in my amygdala and the frontal cortex of my brain. 
When she who first smiled at me, I began to fall. And so my serotonin levels producing anxiety. I couldn't eat or sleep at all. Then a year or two went by with serotonin on the rise till I was feeling comfortable and calm. Now every single time we touch, I get that oxytocin rush. Our bond has never been so strong. I know oxytocin is the potion of devotion. Dial back that dopamine. Here comes serotonin, still going, growing stronger all the time. And I'm never gonna change my mind. Lynn, we've been together for a while now and things are starting to mellow out. But that's okay because we can get those sparks of dopamine back by experiencing new things together. All right, so I hope you could hear that. So, the, I also want to talk about a few other things mastitis. Uh, mastitis is an infection in the mammary gland, usually, it affects only one mammary gland not all of them so if you think all the glands seem warm and swollen it's probably not oxytocin or probably not mastitis it's probably um, inflammation so you'll see one hot swollen gland maybe two you'll notice that the bitch has a fever the milk may look different it may be bloody it may be yellow it may be greenish it may be a different color uh, the gland might abscess and break open usually these are not surgical i will show you a picture of one that is if the puppies aren't getting sick from nursing, they can continue to nurse. Treatment for her consists of antibiotics, fluids to reduce inflammation and keep her fever down and to keep her lactating, anti-inflammatories, again, we can use Medicam. And then if the puppies are old enough and need to be weaned to get them off and get this healed up, you can use cabergoline to help cut down on the length of time that she's gonna have um, lactation. So this is what mastitis will look like on day one. This is not the same dog as the rest of the series. This is a golden retriever that I had a client that sent me pictures every couple of days. So this is what the gland looks like as it's starting to rupture open. That shiny um, spot in the middle is gonna start to open and drain. You'll see here the skin is starting to slough. It's now an open wound, continues to do this. And as long as puppies don't crawl into the gland, you can just put a little um, gauze and a little tape over this and let the bitches continue to nurse. The only time I do surgery on these is if there's a really large opening or if the gland becomes gangrenous and it turns black like this. This gland needs surgery. Most of the other glands we don't do anything with. We just let them heal in along with the antibiotics and the anti-inflammatories. Then the next thing is metritis, which again comes from retained placentas or retained puppies. You can ultrasound these bitches and look for a placenta. Now, if you know how many puppies were there and you had you had eight puppies and eight puppies were born, you're probably fine. There's probably not a retained puppy, but you can see a placenta retained on ultrasound in a way that you won't on an x-ray. So if your veterinarian has an ultrasound machine and they're good at it, they're gonna be able to look at the ultrasound and tell you if that's a retained placenta. To treat those, I use antibiotics, of course, because she's sick, running a fever, um, not feeling good. I use prostaglandins like Lutalyse, to help the uterus to contract because by this point, oxytocin will no longer cause uterine contractions. So to have the uterus expel the placenta or placentas, you need prostaglandins. We'll give fluids and I don't spay these dogs unless I think I'm gonna lose the bitch by waiting. I try really, really hard never to spay a bitch in the um, C-section or in the immediate post-op period because she's gonna lose up to 30% of her blood volume, go into shock and end up in real trouble. So this is an ultrasound um, that will help you to determine that there's a retained placenta. Now this is a resorption site. You aren't gonna see these unless you're at C-section, but these yellow greenish plaques, those are resorption sites where puppies started to develop and didn't go to full term. There are veterinarians who don't interpret this correctly and they don't realize it's a resorption, they think it's a pyometra. In fact, I talked to one last week about it. This is not a pyometra. You do not need to spay these dogs. This will heal up. These are sterile if you culture them, nothing grows. So it is not the same thing as a pyometra. You can't get a pyometra at the um, same time that you have a pregnancy in most cases. It's extremely rare. Resorptions are pretty common. 
So if your veterinarian comes out of the surgery room and says, I think I need to spay her because I see this green, slimy, gooey material, tell them no, flush the uterus, close it up, leave it in, and she'll go on to have another litter the next time you have a breeding. Diarrhea, of course, is also really, really common in the postpartum period. Partly it's from stress, partly it's if the bitch ate all her placentas, and partly it's just that there's so many physiologic changes that are happening that a lot of times these bitches end up with diarrhea. I treat these very conservatively. You don't want to use metronidazole. I know a lot of people like to reach for metronidazole anytime they have diarrhea, but it is not a good choice for bitches that have had their puppies recently. So instead I use kaolin and pectin. I'll use a bland diet and yogurt, and I definitely use probiotics, and you want to make sure she stays well, stays well hydrated. So probiotics can be very, very helpful. They, probiotics will also help reduce mastitis and metritis. So if you have bitches that have a tendency to develop mastitis instead of just routinely reaching for an antibiotic, if you start them on a probiotic prior to the time they whelp, they are much less likely to have mastitis and infections in the uterus. And like I said, we wanna make sure that we're using real kaolin and pectin, which is not the same as human kaopectate. You need to buy the veterinary product so that you have uh, the right treatment. Kaopectate in humans is now the same as Pepto-Bismol and it metabolizes into aspirin, which is not a good idea for puppies or bitches. So use the kaolin and pectin at the farm store or through one of the catalog companies. And then I want to talk about eclampsia. So those of you with a dairy background or maybe even a beef background, mostly dairy, are probably familiar with milk fever in cows. In a cow, when their calcium drops, they develop muscle weakness. They may not uh, calve very well and they will not be able to stand up. Dogs, on the other hand, become tetanic. They develop muscle contractions. This is most commonly seen in low blood calcium in little dogs with big litters. So this little dog here in this picture was at my practice. She had seven puppies and she was only about 12 pounds. So the puppies had used up so much calcium from her milk that she developed this tetanic contraction, um, kind of almost seizure-like activity. So calcium is really essential in managing these. It also comes from her not eating enough calcium and eating enough food altogether. Uh, so you don't wanna start supplementing calcium before the bitch goes into labor, but as soon as she does, if she's got a large litter, you wanna use the gel initially because that's absorbed more quickly and then get her onto a calcium tablet. If she does develop eclampsia, she's gonna have, like I said, almost seizure-like activity. Her temperature is gonna go up. She, this is a true medical emergency. The only way that you can test to see if it really is eclampsia is with an ionized calcium test, and most vet clinics don't have the capacity to run the ionized test. They're gonna run a total calcium and tell you that it's normal, and it might be because it's the ionized calcium portion that's the active portion. This is a true medical emergency. These dogs need to be on IV calcium. This is not something you can do at home. You can give sub-Q calcium, but if they need IV calcium because they look like this, you need to be at an emergency clinic or a clinic that has the ability to run an EKG while they're giving IV calcium, or you will cause her little old heart to stop. So it's very important that you get good medical care for this. This is serious. So now we're gonna talk about our puppies and how we manage our bitches during this postpartum period where we start weaning. So the first thing we have to talk about is how to reduce the bitch's lactation because some bitches will gradually wean their puppies and they do a great job of slowly stopping to lactate. Other bitches, when their puppies are about three weeks old, they're like, you have teeth and I'm not gonna lay here anymore. My corgis are like this. My farm dogs will nurse their puppies until they're old enough to stand up and walk out the door. But my corgi puppies, by three weeks, my bitches are starting to wanna wean them because of the teeth. So to reduce the bitch's lactation, you can reduce her food intake by about 50% for two or three days. You can reduce her water intake, but of course you wanna be careful, especially in hot weather. Uh, Cabergoline can be used if necessary. And the other thing you can do is just go to Walmart, pick up a one piece bathing suit, bikinis don't work, and put her in a little bathing suit or a t-shirt, and then she can still hang out with the puppies, but the puppies can't get to the mammary glands and continue to nurse so that she will start to dry up. At the same time, we need to make sure that our puppies are increasing their intake so that they're getting enough to drink and eat while the bitch is starting to uh, wean them and her lactation is starting to drop off. What a lot of us forget is water is the most important nutrient that we give our dogs. It's not dog food, it's water. So we have to make sure that starting at about two and a half to three and a half weeks, we offer water. You can use it in a shallow, heavy dish like this pie plate or the picture on the right, for those of you who are familiar with chickens, this is a chicken waterer, works really well. 
I also use Lixit bottles for my puppies. I'll put this on the X-Pen and put a little bit of chicken baby food on the uh, tip of that bottle. It's sort of like a big gerbil bottle with a uh, metal tip and then a metal ball in the end. So you can offer water to the puppies. And by the time puppies are about five or six weeks old, they can very comfortably be drinking out of these bottles. And it's really nice because they're not turning their uh, water dish into a swimming pool and ending up with stool and food and a big mess in the whelping box. So it works really nicely. Then your transition piece, you'll want to start um, a liquid diet and then you'll start mixing a kibble, mi mixing kibble with it. You can uh, pulverize the kibble, you can blender the kibble, you can soften it, but very gradually you can start offering the same kibble that you're feeding to the uh, mom, you can start feeding it to the puppies. Every now and then you'll have a bitch with puppies this age, this is one of my farm dogs, and she was um, in this litter starting to vomit for her puppies. So if you have a healthy bitch that seems like she's fine, and suddenly when the puppies are nursing, she starts to vomit, she's not sick, she's just producing food for the puppies. So if you're seeing this happen, don't misinterpret it as a dog that's sick. So now we have to talk a little bit more about feeding. I like using trays like this. This is a chip and dip tray that you can buy at the dollar store for a dollar. It's a nice way to have the divisions in the tray so that the puppies get access to their own section of the tray. I also had a client that built one of these. She built one with two sides so that there were eight um, small bowls for the puppies so they can all have a separate place to eat and not compete too much. So these are nice ways that you can get the puppies to start eating on their own. And then we had some fun with food. I wanna keep this from being just a really boring old lecture. And these are some of the fun things that we've done. We've done this, um, I've done this to keep puppies busy. You can put um, food in a muffin tin and you can very easily put, this is a ginger snap with some peanut butter. Now this is not a balanced diet. This is just to keep a puppy busy, busy in the exam room. But I do have the opportunity to take these muffin tins, metal ones please, not the silicone ones. You can mix dog kibble with some water or some yogurt, put it in the freezer. If you have those puppies that gulp their food down really, really quickly, by freezing it first, you can slow them down and then they can have a chance to have a little bit more share time um, and not just compete with each other or compete in the, uh, or eat their food so quickly that they choke on it. So these muffin tins are great tools. And then we can have a little bit more fun. Now, um, this, summer I went to the grocery store and picked up all kinds of fruits and vegetables and started to give them to my dogs. These are honeydew melons that I cut in half, scooped out the seeds, and then I split, just ran some a knife through to kind of divide it into some sections like you would a grapefruit, put this down and gave the puppies uh, a chance to kind of mess around a little bit with um, a, a, something new, something different for flavors and textures. Um, this is a combination of corgi and farm dog litter, uh, so they're all together um, having a little bit of fun with this, so you can do this. One of the other things that we um, did was um, some other, well, I'll show you here in a minute. Um, the rules are going to be avoid grapes and raisins, which of course we know are toxic. Avoid onions, potatoes, and corn. They're too starchy. Onions can be toxic. You want to avoid rinds, avoid rinds. So like watermelon, honeydew, that kind of stuff. As soon as they get down to the rind, I throw it away. Make sure you're not giving corn on the cob because dogs will eat the entire cob and that can be very dangerous for them. Um, avoid too much skin if it's on um, apples or, or too much skin and apple seeds. And I don't want you to exceed more than 10% of their daily intake uh, with dog food. 90% should be dog food and then you can have 10% or less. One of these other things that are kind of fun for them to have for new experiences. So for enrichment, it's nice for them to have new textures, new flavors, new opportunities kind of fun things to do, slows them down, gives us something to do all day instead of just laying around chewing on each other. Um, this is one of my puppies that was chasing a cherry tomato around the kitchen. So again, having some fun with, you can't see the tomato, but she, she can. So she's chasing tomatoes around. There's a lot of fun things you can do with these puppies so that they um, don't just have a boring environment. Some other things we can do for environmental enrichment are to change up surfaces because there have been some limitations in getting puppies socialized. Uh, I think that giving them new opportunities at your own kennel or own facility with different surfaces can be a lot of fun. So I went to Walmart one day and I bought two of every kind of bath mat they had. And by the way, they had 11. So I bought a whole different series of bath mats that gave the puppies new surfaces, new opportunities to get their feed onto things that they hadn't felt before. So the bath mats come with square holes and with bristles and they come with slats and they come shiny 
and they can come in all different configurations. So it's a chance for your puppies to have some um, opportunities for experiencing different environmental opportunities, some environmental enrichment without having to leave the house. Um, you can also go and buy just a full-length mirror, lay it down on its side. You can get those at Walmart for $7. So you use one on a litter, you throw it away, it's not a big deal. Uh, $7 is well worth the time that it takes to go to the store and get some socialization for the puppies. Uh, giving them other surfaces like rocker boards or wobble boards. Um, this one on the right is one that you can use for your own fitness opportunities, but they make wobble boards for dogs. You can build little, little tiny miniature agility equipment so that puppies are starting to get the feel of uh, teeters and A-frames and some other things just very, very low, just two inches off the ground, so they're not going to hurt themselves. And then this is also um, some environmental enrichment I set up at my house. There's on the um, middle of the picture is a rabbit hutch. And so the puppies could go in and out of that, up and down the ramps, on and off the roof, have some kind of fun things to do. Um, you can see the Lixit bottle on the side. You can see a PVC tubing that I use that they go through that like a tunnel. And then we built the puppy enrichment center at the back with a whole bunch of different kinds of um, noises and textures and feels and things to do. And then the, the tray on the right hand side is a litter box tray. So this is my puppy's environmental enrichment center with a place for them to go potty. Then deworming. I want to make sure that we've talked about this. I know we've presented this in previous presentations, but I just want to make sure that everybody remembers that if you want to prevent roundworms and hookworms in your puppies so that they never end up with parasites, you can put the bitch on fenbendazole for the last three weeks of her pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation. Uh, it's the same dose that you would normally use, which is one cc of the suspension for four pounds of body weight. So a 10 pound dog gets two and a half cc's and a 40 pound dog gets 10 cc's. Works very effectively in keeping the puppies from having parasites. If you didn't do that, then you can do parental PAMA weight, which comes in a couple of different versions, tablets and liquid at two weeks, four weeks and six weeks of age. And then when they get to be eight weeks of age, you can start your oral heartworm prevention products so that you can um, manage their intestinal parasites. But it's a lot nicer to deworm the bitch than it is to chase down and deworm all the puppies. The other part about parasite control we wanna talk about will be hookworms, I'm sorry, heartworms and then fleas and ticks. Heartworm prevention uh, should be started. You can start as early as eight weeks of age if the puppies are large enough very clear on the labels which products are safe and which are not. Make sure when you're reading labels that you're looking at breeding animals, not just pregnant dogs. So Trifexis is not labeled as a heartworm preventive. Most of the others are, including ProHeart, which is the injectable 12-month product. So you can use those products for heartworm prevention, even during pregnancy. And then parasite control for fleas and ticks. The only oral product that's labeled for use for prevention and treatment is Brevecto. The other three, Semperica, Prodelio, and Nexgard are not labeled for breeding animals. The topicals, some are and some are not. So you have to read the labels. You can very easily Google search product label of the product that you're looking at, bring it up, read it. And if it says that it's okay in breeding animals, then it's fine. But if it doesn't say that it's okay in a breeding animal, it says not tested in breeding animals, don't use it. And remember, your breeding animal may be your eight week old little puppy bitch or little puppy dog that you're planning on raising up to be a breeding animal. So just because they're eight weeks old doesn't mean they're not a breeding animal. Please read the labels very carefully before you start these. And if you have any questions, I have a document with pretty much all, all the drugs summarized in it. If you email me, I can send that to you so you don't have to look at 30 different labels. Then when you take your puppies to the veterinary clinic for their comprehensive puppy physical exam prior to the time that you sell them, I just went through this list. And again, um, you can watch this presentation again, or you can take pictures as we go through the slides. But I went through the things that I check out when I'm doing physical exam on puppies to make sure that before they're being sold or being retained in a breeding program, that you have had your veterinarian specifically look for these problems that are going to tell you that this dog should or should not be in a breeding program or should or should not, may or may not need to have some treatment prior to the time that they're sold or letting people know that are buying dogs that this is the case. So entropion is when the eyelid rolls in. That's a surgical condition. Dystichia are extra eyelashes on the edge of the eyelid. That can be surgical. Epiphora is extra tearing. That might mean something as minor as a blocked tear duct, or it may just be that the way the puppy's little face is shaped, but puppies should not have wet um, tearing down the sides of their faces. So be aware if there's epiphora or 
tearing, there might be something that needs to be looked into further. For ears, they should be checked for ear infection, ear mites, excessive amounts of hair, and yes, you need to make sure that they have an ear canal. I've actually seen one dog that was born without, so make sure that they have an ear uh, canal on each side. In the mouth, you want to check the color of their gums to make sure that they're nice and pink. They should be checked for a cleft palate and or cleft lip. They should be checked for their dental or their tooth alignment. You can see overbites, underbites, which means either the jaw is too long, the upper jaw is too long, or the upper jaw is too short compared to the lower jaw. We can see base narrow where the lower two canine teeth are too close together and they poke holes in the roof of the mouth. And we can also see either missing teeth or extra teeth. Now the teeth that we see in a puppy at eight weeks of age, if they're missing two teeth, that doesn't tell us they're gonna be missing two adult teeth. You don't know what their adult teeth are gonna do until they have adult teeth. But in some breeds, missing teeth can be a disqualification in the breed. So be aware before you're selling puppies what your breed standard is requiring. Lymph nodes, we shouldn't see any swelling of the lymph nodes. If we do, we'd be looking at something potentially like strangles. Um, and for the skin, we wanna look at their coat to make sure that they have normal coat. We wanna look for rashes, very common on the tummy of these little puppies, or any parasites, including demodex and fleas and other kinds of mites. For their heart, they should be listened to by a veterinarian to listen for a heart murmur. That's a very significant thing that you cannot typically find. So this is a really strong reason for your to have your puppies checked by a vet. Um, rib cage, we wanna look at the length, the shape. Um, we'll see short ribbed puppies. Um, we'll see floating ribs. We'll see um, what Pat Hastings called calls herring gut, where the rib cage is really short and their um, abdomen is not as well protected by the ribs. So we can see those things. Um, those generally are not serious health concerns, but they might be a concern if it's a dog that you're keeping for show. Uh, and then a prominent xiphoid process, which is that little flap of cartilage on the very end of the um, sternum. Those commonly are really prominent, but again, not a health concern, just something that people notice. Uh, hernias, we usually check for umbilical and inguinal hernias. Umbilical hernia is the belly button. Inguinal is down in the groin, most commonly seen in the toy breeds. So your veterinarian should be checking for inguinal and umbilical hernias. For the joints, they should check their patellas, their kneecaps to see if they're popping on and off. They should look at their front legs to see if there's any deviation of their front legs at the wrist. That can mean that we've got a nutritional imbalance and that needs to be corrected very quickly before the puppies are sold. And then they'll sometimes feel the hips to see if there's any kind of a click called an Ortolani sign that would be predictive of hip dysplasia. For toes, they should have the right number of toes. They should have four big toes and a dew claw on the front and then four toes on the back, sometimes with a dew claw. Sometimes puppies are missing toes or nails. Not, again, a health concern, but something to be noted. On abdominal palpation, we want to feel what the organ size is. Does, do any organs feel enlarged? In the rectum, we want to make sure that there actually is one. And typically, by six weeks of age, you're not going to be unaware if the puppy didn't have a rectum. But at two days of age, we can see puppies that don't have a rectum, and that can cause some very serious health problems. Um, the prepuce, um, which is where the penis is conveniently stored for the male dogs, we see a lot of young puppies with what we call balanopostitis, which is that little sticky discharge that comes from the tip of the prepuce or the penis. Not serious. Almost all boy puppies have it, but it is something that new pet owners get a little freaked out about because they're not really comfortable with um, that kind of anatomy, but that's really common. Penile frenulum is when there's a little bit of tissue on the penis that uh, is attached to the underside and it keeps it from being normally uh, extended when the puppy urinates. And hypospadia is when there's a gap in the prepuce and along the whole underside of the penis, there's, a, there's an opening. Um, testicles, both testicles should be in the pres present in the scrotum after three weeks of age. If you can't feel them both at three weeks, that's a delayed descent of the testicles and anybody buying the dog for breeding or for um, showing needs to be made aware of that. I see puppies all the time that were sold being uh, unaware that they bought a puppy with one testicle, and that's definitely a disqualification in any AKC um, confirmation event of any breed. And then the vagina, we see lots of puppies with puppy vaginitis, which again is that sticky little mucousy stuff that we can see on the boys. It's absolutely normal. It is not a reason to put a dog on an antibiotic. And then we'll often see inverted vulvas as well, where the vulva is just a little bit less protruding. And typically those will outgrow and they will be absolutely normal after a heat cycle. So those are the physical exam findings. Um, there, here's a, 
uh, cover of each of the two books that I've written. If anybody's interested, you can let me know. Um, but they're both very handy books to have. I have a lot of people that really love a reproduction book uh, for their breeding colonies and then for their new puppies when you're um, selling puppies. I'm encouraging people to get their puppy the people who want to buy puppies from them, get a copy of the book to them before they buy a puppy from you so that before they take that puppy home, they already know how to socialize it, they already know how to crate train it, they've already got some education. And I'm sure all of you have really great puppy materials, but this can make your burden a lot easier when you're trying to sell puppies to people and they have 18,000 questions. So you can refer to the book. It's um, recently written. It does talk about delaying, spaying, and neutering. It does talk about three-year vaccination protocols. It's very up-to-date and has a chart in it for flea tick and heartworm prevention, what can be used and what can't. So it should be a very useful book for everybody. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for this last of the series. Um, thank you to Purina Pro Plan and the American Kennel Club for the sponsorship. This is how to reach me. You're absolutely welcome to contact us and email me. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I hope everybody learned a lot of great information during the last couple of webinars that we've done. And if you've missed anything, please feel free to go back and pick anything up that you need to. And I'm happy to help you out with anything that I can. So that's all I have for you tonight. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Marty Greer, for all of the, that great information. And if you'll be sure and leave that slide up there uh, for everybody to get that uh, website and email address. I just want everybody to know that you can contact Dr. Marty with your questions and she's happy to answer those for you or if you'd like to buy a copy of her book. Um, but we did have several good questions. So let's start from the top and kind of work our way through them and see if we can get all of uh, through all of them very quickly. Both Heidi and Ian have asked uh, about x-rays. Um, do you get much from a VD radiograph and why uh, do you prefer two lateral views versus one lateral and one VD? I have found VDs to be an absolute waste. Um, I have never been successful with them because the backbone, the spine overlays. So you can completely lose the ability to see a puppy in that uh, orientation. So I only take a right lateral and a left lateral. I never take a VD. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate that answer. And uh, we've had um, some individuals with questions about uh, the calcium and the oxytocin as to what are the dosages and when you give it and can you give that uh, with each pregnancy and do you, have you had any problems giving that? So the calcium, if you give the 10% injectable, that can be really safe. I dose it at one cc per 10 pounds of body weight. So a 50 pound dog will get five cc's and I divide it into two injection sites. You cannot use the 23% cow, cow product. So make sure you're using 10% calcium gluconate. If you're doing an injection and give it sub Q, don't give it IV. IV, you can give it too quickly and cause the heart to stop. The gel, um, I start it as soon as I think the bitch is starting labor. I know not everybody agrees with that, but I've had very good success with improving uterine contractility and shortening the time it takes for a bitch to whelp a litter. So I'll give um, calcium and there's the dial on the tube will give you the dose for small dog, large dog. So just typically about one cc for a small dog. And then you can repeat it between each puppy so that she can continue to have good uterine contractions. Oxytocin, most people overdose oxytocin. And the dose should be itsy bitsy teeny weeny. When I dose my farm dogs, which are 20 pound dogs, I give 0 0.01 cc's. And I mean that is one hundredth of a cc, not a tenth, not the first line on the syringe, the, the one tenth of that. So it's 0 0.01 cc's for those little dogs. Um, I will never give more than 0 0.2 cc's at a dose and I never give more than two doses per puppy and I never give it before the first puppy is born. So I'm very, very conservative on my oxytocin doses. If you overdo it, you're gonna shrink wrap the puppies and or rupture the bitch's uterus. So I look at the oxytocin doses that Whelpwise has determined are the most effective. If you give a big dose, you may shrink wrap the puppies and lose the puppy to a loss of blood flow. You may rupture the bitch's uterus. Um, or you may end up just with a real mess on your hands. Um, and then they they won't actually start having contractions until the oxytocin is metabolizing and starting to wear out, uh, wear off. So normally 
you should start to see great contractions after a dose of oxytocin about five to seven minutes after you give it. And then you just need to kind of step back and be out of the way. First, you walk the bitch and make sure her bladder is empty, her colon is empty. Then I give a little bit of ice cream and a little bit of calcium, and then I'll give oxytocin. Oxytocin is the last thing that I reach for when I'm in the process of trying to help these bitches have their puppies. Oxytocin comes last on my list because we can be much more effective if we've done those other things first. Walk her, give her ice cream, give her calcium gel, and then a teensy, eensy, weensy, bitsy little dose of oxytocin. Thank you very much, Dr. Marty. I appreciate that. That was very helpful. And I answered several of the questions that we had. So that should uh, help everybody to circle back and be able to uh, catch that at the end if if they need to. So I uh, had another question on x-rays. Uh, if you're breeding extra large dogs, how do you suggest getting an accurate x-ray count? He, uh, This individual has not been able to get uh, a, an accurate count with multiple veterinarians on extra large dogs, extra large big yeah. size dogs. And that's really true. Um, once you get into those bigger dogs, you get a lot more scatter. So what we had to do was work with our x-ray company to get a grid put into our x-ray machine. So this is something that your veterinarian is gonna have to work on. If they're not getting good x-rays, um, they can ask for a grid from their x-ray digital company. And the other thing we do is when we lay them on their side, we kind of stretch them out so that their front legs are as far comfortably forward and their back legs are as far comfortably back as they can be. And that helps to kind of flatten out the bitch so that she's not quite as round and in you know ball shaped in the middle so it is easier to see but yes you're absolutely right when you get to these really big bitches sometimes they don't even fit on the 17 long inch long x-ray cassette because their their belly from their rib to their pelvis is longer than 17 inches so you're absolutely right about that but most of the time even on really big labradors and other large breed dogs we can do well once we get into the dogs that are 120 pounds and up I would agree with you, it's harder to get a good x-ray. And then you might just need to take one at the end. So when you think you're done whelping, have a vet that will see you the next morning, go in and get an x-ray taken and just make sure that she's done having her puppies before you comfortably settle in. Thank you very much. You had also mentioned um, getting the x-ray done in the morning and withholding the uh, food and making sure she's well walked before going into her appointment. What if the appointment's in the afternoon? Do you go ahead and recommend withholding food that entire time and circling back to the oxytocin and calcium um, on the 0.01 cc per, was that per 10 pounds or per 20 pounds they were asking? I do 0.01 per per 10 to 20, depending on the how many doses I've given. Um, I start off really low. You can always give a little bit more. I dose very, very low. Um, so you can always give a, a wee bit more if you need to, but tiny, tiny doses. Um, there's not a good published dose so that you can really actually fall back on it. And the other question was about x-rays. Um, if she has to fast for the morning, nobody's gonna starve to death by getting an x-ray at two o'clock in the afternoon. So don't feed her that morning or feed her super early, like six o'clock in the morning so that she's had time to digest her breakfast before you go in. Because the bitches that are close to term are gonna have delayed stomach emptying. You can just take along a bowl of food and as soon as her x-ray is done, she can have breakfast at two o'clock in the afternoon. But it's much more effective to get a good x-ray than it is to miss out on a puppy because you fed her a big old breakfast. Okay, have you found it useful for an ultrasound to get an accurate count on puppies? Nope, I don't. I can get pretty close on ultrasound, I'm pretty good, but it's like a movie instead of a snapshot and you're always gonna have the chance that puppies are moving in and out of the field and you are not gonna be as accurate with an ultrasound as you are an x-ray. Absolutely, I don't care how good the ultrasonographer is, you're gonna be better with an x-ray for a count. Okay, one real quick question about uh, fading puppy syndrome syndrome at four to five days after uh, birth. So fading what puppy is sort of, yeah, fading puppy is kind of a catch-all phrase for puppies that fail to thrive. And there are so many reasons for that. We'll have to go through a whole neonatal lecture to go through that. So make sure that they're gaining weight, their urine color is pale, and that they're getting enough to eat and drink. And if they're not, then start tube feeding and then start diagnostics to figure out what's going on. And of course, before you tube feed, you need to make sure their temperature is at least 96 degrees rectal. But that's a whole neonatal lecture that we don't, we, we can't tackle tonight. 
Okay, one last question before we cut us cut off for the end, and I want everybody to remember that if we did not get to your question, go ahead and you can email that to Dr. Marty Greer at vv at k9stork.com, and that is k, the number nine, stork.com. And uh, this, uh, Sam has had uh, two females have some type of a blood disorder after having their litters um is it okay to give clavamox to them after they've uh, after they've had a, a litter yes clavamox is safe amoxicillin and clavamox are safe cephalexin is safe some of the other drugs are not so stick to those in that drug class if you can at all and there are lists of these drugs that are safe and are not safe in the book uh, the neonatal book and also on um, the veterinary information network that your vet may be a participant in so there are good resources for people out there that are looking to make sure that they're using safe drugs. Okay, um, let me just check here and see if I've missed anything. I think we've gotten most of the questions or covered it. Um, and just as a reminder, the web, oh, oh on the bratwurst, uh, do you do that raw or cooked? Oh, that is a great question, and I didn't and I didn't mention that. I fry them. I don't boil them in beer because you lose a lot of the fat and the drippings. So I, I fry them and then um, give a small amount to a small dog, a bigger amount to a large dog because you can get some diarrhea from it. And I don't know what there's magical in those brats because it's not fenugreek. I, I, one of my clients actually owns a company that makes the seasoning mixes that go into the locker plants um, when they make bratwurst and there's not fenugreek in there so I don't know what it is if it's the salt or if it's the fat or if it's the combination but fry them slice them up cool them of course slice them up and little dogs get maybe a quarter of a brat at each meal bigger dogs can have a full brat and I don't know why it's magical but if you're having trouble with lactation on your bitches get brats cooked up ahead of time so that you're not scrambling to go to the store at the last minute get those ready to go I get pictures from my clients. Look, I'm ready to whelp, and it's a skillet full of bratwurst. They, they may not have set up their whelping box, but they have brats. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to throw one last one in here. If you have a veterinarian who will not give you oxytocin, uh, what is your suggestion for that? Uh, you can see if you can find another veterinarian. You can talk to them. <laughs> See if they're if they're willing to do it if you follow some of their rules because a lot of veterinarians have been trained to be careful with the use of oxy, oxytocin and that's okay but if you um, are careful with them you get your puppy count x-ray you get your calcium you have your ducks in a row um, they may be willing to do it but they're not going to send you a 100 cc bottle i send it out the door in four syringes with it pre-measured in teeny little doses so maybe if your vet will work with you on a really small dose they'd be more comfortable you can you can continue working with them if, if they're willing to do that all right the um, last question for the evening is for pain medications on collies how do you feel about that and um, uh, have you been able what have you had any problems with MDR1 gene dogs and pain medications not with pain medications butorphanol might be a concern. Reglan is a concern. Metoclopramide or Reglan is a concern. But Medicam and Rimadil, I have never had a problem with it. And I have Corgis, which, you know, any of the white footed breeds are reason, you know, we have reason to be careful and reason for concern. Uh, but I have not had trouble with MDR dogs not being able to tolerate Medicam or Rimadil. If you have, let me know because I've not seen that and I've never seen any of those drugs on the MDR1 list. All right. Um, that kind of brings us to the close of our evening, I believe. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And I apologize if we did not get to your questions. Hopefully we were as close as we could. And um, if you have any further questions, feel free to email Dr. Marty at, and her address again is VV as in Victor Victor at K as in King nine, the number stork dot com. So thank you all for attending and thank you Prairie to Pro Plan for sponsoring our webinar tonight and everybody have a great evening. Thanks everybody. Good night. Good night.